So once again, I will go through that, that disclaimer I just made since we did it before to make sure that anyone that wanted off could, but um, this is being recorded. It will be placed on the Kingdom of Artemisia YouTube channel. And if you do not want to be recorded, uh, please turn off your, your video and uh, you can catch this later. Hi, um, I am Praxila Tarna. I live in the Kingdom of Artemisia. I am a research geek. I absolutely love uh, crazy rabbit holes. I, I go down the whole Warren and follow all the little, all the little tunnels. Um, my major, major geek and interest is the 16th century uh, Venetian printing industry. And that is how we have come here to today's topic, which is fairy tales and the rise of the 16th century written story. Um, we are going to be addressing fairy tales as, as written stories because while there is a history of them previous, as we all know, it's a lot more difficult to document something when there are no documents. So we, we will be talking about very, very late period printed sources because um, there's, there's not a lot available that way. But if you're, if you're aware of the printed sources, you can go back and look at where they're coming from look at where they're going, and it gives you a real good idea of what some of those, or what some of that oral history is. So, let's see here. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. We will talk this through. If people have any questions, please feel free to ask them. You can ask them in the chat. You can ask them, just turn on your mic and ask. That's also, Absolutely fine. I have no problem with that at all. Um, but we are going to be running through the rise of written stories in the 16th century. And primarily that means we will be talking about uh, Giovanni Francesco uh, Straparola. So I got interested in fairy tales for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I have children and they like fairy tales. Secondly, I did a fun, sweetheart, I'm hi sweetie, I'm recording right now. Thank you, love you. Um, I have children. <laughs> um, I did a fairy tale feast about seven or eight years ago and hey guys, can you, okay, all right. So we're gonna start, um, I know this, we normally put sources at the end, but we're gonna start with sources because that's where the stories come from. We'll start with some sources, we'll talk about the writing, and um, I may read a couple towards the end. But um, here's some ideas for sources and for the reading. And a lot of this is very recent because a lot of this information um, and the interest in it is very recent. There was there were some translations of some of these books back at the end of the 19th century, but a lot of them haven't been retranslated until very recently. Um, so let's start with Fairy Tale in the Ancient World. Um, this is pre a book that's previous to what we're going to be talking about, but it is fabulous, totally worth. If you have any interest in um, fairy and folk tale folklore, um, read read Graham Anderson super, super uh, useful and really great about showing you where a lot of these um, folk tales are coming from, where, this, where the story follows through cultures and also where we're able to look at a later book, a later story, and by going through textually and looking at various language choices and things, follow, follow it back. Um, Folklore is an incredibly exciting area of, uh, of research right now. Um, well, I mean, it's always very intriguing, but really the last, the last 10 or 15, 20 years have just had an explosion. It's been super fabulously interesting, and there's some amazing research work coming out of it. Um, another one that I recommend a lot, again, is not what we're going to be covering tonight, but 
definitely worth looking at is Fairy Tales from Before Fairy Tales, The Medieval Latin Past of Wonderful Lies. Uh, it goes into um, a lot of 10th and 12th and 13th century manuscripts and seeing some of the stories being brought in out of the oral tradition and little bits and pieces in, in Latin and, and just fabulously interesting stuff. Um, Ruth uh, Bottingheimer's Fairy Godfather. Um, this is a really interesting book. I, it's definitely worth reading. Her thesis is rather contentious because she's of the view that fairy tales were not invented until the 16th century, that, that uh, Straparola actually in, invented fairy tales. Um, I don't agree. Most folklorists don't agree, but it's a really intriguing thesis and a lot of her other research is super, super amazing and definitely worth a read, but it's one of those ones where go in realizing that uh, it is not, well, I mean, it's one of those things when you read anything, it, it's a theory and you've got to look at where the theory is coming from and the information coming and don't just accept as is, but it's certainly um, an amazing book for discussion. And that came out in 2002. Um, Jack Zipes, The Great Fairy Tale Tradition. Um, he edited some really great essays as well as some nice translations. Um, this is, the next one is the actual book we're gonna be talking about a lot tonight, um, the Giovan Francesco Straparolo's The Pleasant Nights. This is the most recent translation. It came in in 20, 2015. Previous to that, the most recent translation was one done in 1897 and then again um, reprinted in 1901. So there's a big gap, huge gap in, in the availability. So it's really, it's really wonderful to have this available. Um, I also have a link a little bit later on to a copy of that 1897 translation that is available on archive. So you can just go click on it and access it. It's super easy to get a hold of. Um, Out of the Woods, this is one of my favorite books. It's one of the ones that got me go going and reading on this. Um, the Origins of the Literary Fairy Tale in Italy and France by Nancy Canepa came out in 1997. Um, it is really a great, really a great book. It does, however, focus mostly on 17th century because it goes into uh, Peral and some of the other French and a lot of that is because, like I said before, um, the actual printed fairy tales, the first example of printed fairy tales we have is Straparola, which is coming out in 1550. So it's really there at the end. It's very much at the end. Um, those, the tales are, appear to be considerably older, but the actual printing of them is, is, is right there at the tail end. And we'll explain why in a, in a bit. Um, another one by uh, Nancy Canepa is From Court to Forest, uh, John Pettis Batista Basile's Lo Conto di Lo Conti, The Tale of Tales and the Birth of, of the Literary Fairy Tale. We'll mention him a little bit as well. He's slightly out of period in 1643. Um, another fascinating book is Twice Upon a Time, Women Writer, Writers and the History of the Fairy Tale. And we'll talk about that a little bit because in a, in a huge number of cases, the majority of the early cases especially, our narrators are female. Um, and that's going to be something we'll talk about in just a minute. All right. Um, any questions so far other than, hey, cool books that I, whatever there, cracks. <laughs> um, previously in the world of fairy tales, uh, we have literary tales, which usually are usually derived from the oral tradition, but you also have later examples of, uh, or of literary tales that find their way into the oral tradition. So, um, that happens more in the 19th century with like um, Hans Andersen, but but it does happen where where tales, uh, fairy tales are so interesting that in in a liter literary sense that they're brought back in and 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 retold orally. So it's there's a, there's this huge amazing give and take once we get a written culture going. Um, as I just mentioned when I was talking about Elizabeth. Uh, Newton's book, uh, Harry's book. Um, it, there's an interesting history of his, uh, female narrators. One of the earliest books we, we know of um, is The Arabian Nights, and it uh, has Shahrazad, who was a female narrator. Um, the, this framing device we see a lot in these early books, um, Straparola, 
facile. Um, in a lot of cases, there are women telling these stories. Um, and, and a lot of that is because they're, you know, they're considered kind of a throwaway. They're considered, you know, women's, not, not these amazing chivalric romances, but, uh, but shorter tales, funny, funny stories, often body. Um, so, so we do see a lot of um, association with women in these, interestingly enough. We also had, when I was talking about um, the, the 11th and 12th and 13th century, we have medieval poems and stories that show up in a lot of manuscripts. Um, one of the most famous of those is our from a Cistercian monk, um, John of Alta Silva, and he's French. Um, and if you're interested in, in those early works, I, I can't recommend that book enough. Um, okay, so based on textual clues that we find throughout this, we know that a lot of, of our stories that we know today, and a lot of stories that they knew in the 17th century and they knew um, in the 18th century that are in Grimm's fairy tales, are based are much older and based on textual clues. We can assume that things like Cinderella, Snow White, Rumpelstiltskin, Little Red Riding Hood, Twelve Dancing Princesses, Puss in Boots, they're all much older stories. Um, and if you're interested in that, there's some fabulous work. That's based, that's the basis of folk uh, folklore uh, research, and it's super cool but we're not gonna talk about that too much tonight because I do wanna talk about some of the stories themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about why Italy, because I am gonna focus on Italy. First of all, I like Italy. My research is coming from Italy. I'm major into the Italian printing industry. And so I ran across the Italian ones first, but it turns out that the Italian ones were, were first. And there's a few reasons why. First of all, because we have a salon culture in Italy. Um, Italy, as part of the Renaissance culture, you get people sitting down in, you know, and having games and playing and, and reading and talking philosophy and looking at older text and um, having these groupings that and we get things out of that, like early on in Florence, we get madrigals. Um, we get various types of culture building because of these groups that are getting together to do these sorts of things. And part of that coming out of that are these, um, these literary stories, things like the Decameron um, and Straparola and various other, the idea of fiction being written is, is coming out of that sort of culture as well. It's also a cultural crossroads, and we get a lot of Eastern in influences. We get a lot of things like the Arabian Nights are coming in. Uh, while we don't have a translation of that into, a, into one of the major European languages until the 18th century, um, they're, being, they're probably, well, they're pretty much guaranteed to be, be being told um, orally because we see those same stories show up um, in cultures that have been that have come into contact with those Arabic cultures. Um, they, they don't just randomly show up. They, they, they show up based on, on when those cultures come together. Or we see Chinese stories that pop up over here. And it's because those cultures are, are exchanging. And Venice is very much that. It is, it is very much the point where the Eastern and Western worlds are, are meeting as, uh, as, we, uh, as the Eastern groups push further and further in. Um, also printing, printing is one of the major ones because we're talking about um, literary culture. We're talking about examples that we as a modern culture can go and look at and read about. If you have printing, you have the ability to read as opposed to, well, we knew it happened in an oral culture and it's so much more difficult to, to document that. But with printing, we can document it. And um, Venice is the center of a printing industry. Um, we also have a, a huge center in, in um, some of the German areas, but Venice is huge. Um, starting between 
1501 and 1600, there are 1300, 1300 different presses. Now, um, there's a huge Ooh. amount of, of printed material coming out of Venice, coming out of Italy. Um, and they, they need things to print. And so they're finding things to print. They're, it's not just a matter of everybody prints a Bible. I mean, they, they need other things to print and they need various things for various people, various audiences, everything from, from maps to um, brochures telling you about how the latest war is going on, quite literally. Um, those are happening from like the French fronts. Uh, we have, we have pieces of, of music happening, um, that doesn't come in, in, in England so much because there's different copyright restrictions, but in Italy, they're, they're putting out those sorts of things. They are, they are finding things to print. And some of the things to print are stories because people want them. Um, especially as female, um, female literacy rises. Female literacy in the 1600s is only 13%, but that is a huge rise. And it's um, when you compare it to male literacy of about 33%. But that 13% um, of women are, are reading and they're purchasing books or not, if not necessarily books, then small octavos and, and bits of paper that have information on them. And so the printers are, are um, finding things to print. And so that's why we're getting things like these stories is because there are people that want them. Any questions so far? Okay. I think I might have missed it, but um, why did they need to print stuff? Money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a huge, um, printing is actually a really popular uh, way to to become a uh, a uh, to have your own business, it starts out with really small printing. It's there's some outlay to it, but it's actually a really welcoming um, job for immigrants. Surprisingly, uh, it's one of those things. It, it doesn't have a guild until the 1580s, and so it's open enough, and there is enough of a demand that if you start small with you know, printing on cheap paper a couple of pages, you can work your way up so that you can print something larger. Um, there's also a lot of give and take in the various uh, parts of the printing culture. And there's what's called privilegio, which is sort of, we kind of think of it as copyright, but it's not exactly that. And it's permission from the Senate to print, but most things that are printed especially if they're small and cheap and have limited text, you don't need privilegio. So um, there's not a lot of regulation, but there is a lot of money to be made. And that's why. D does that answer the question? Oh yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. All right, we are gonna talk about the first example of published tales where we have fairy tales, literally a, a story that involves a supernatural agent of some kind, normally referred to as, as a fairy. Um, they're also called rise tales sometimes, where an individual will start with nothing, start, you know, and that's quite frequently the, the thing. They have nothing, they're poverty stricken, or they, or they have lost everything and been reduced to to nothing and then thanks to supernatural, um, some sort of supernatural something or other, they, they rise, they become better. Um, and that's, you see that a lot in what we call fairy tales. So the first published one um, is Giovanni Francesco Sarapparola's La Piacevola Notte or The Pleasant Nights. You'll also re see it referred to as The Facetious Nights or um, just Straparola's nights, um, but but that's that's what it's called. Um, it was first published in Venice in 1551 for the first volume and 1553 for the second volume. After that, it pretty much becomes a single volume um, in 1555, 
And there's about 20 editions published before the end of the century. Um, an edition in Venice is approximately between 100 and 400 books, depending on how large the edition is. And those are documented examples from publishers we know of. There may have been more, but there were at least 20 editions published. This was a popular book. It, it sold well. If you are interested in reading an English translation of this, um, W.G. Waters' translation is available at Archive. Um, you can search Straparola and it'll, it'll come up or there's the, there's the, the link. Um, and that is originally from 1897. It was published as sort of a, a limited edition to a, a, book, a book club kind of a thing. And here's why. Because that last, if you look down, down at this slide, it tells you that 19th century translations were actively marketed as erotica. Body tales are, defined, are definitely a part of things. These are not children's tales. We think of fairy tales as children's tales. And there are some in here that might be appropriate for children, often are appropriate for children. Uh, but there's a lot in there that is not, especially because um, it's a framing tale and it's a mix. And it, just like if, you, if you've read all of, uh, all of the Arabian Nights, definitely not all for children. These were not aimed at children. They were just aimed at people. It's set in a framing tale, which is basically a story that gives you a reason to tell stories in this case. So in Arabian Nights, the story is Scheherazade is trying to keep her head and so she has to come up with a new tale every day. Um, the Decameron is you have a bunch of people who are fleeing the plague and entertaining each other. In, um, <clears throat> in Straparola, the, the framing tale is that there is a group of people and they have left Venice and gone to the island of Murano, which is where the glass is. But they've gone to, the, to Murano during carnival. They're at a villa there and they're entertaining each other. And they're told over um, 13 nights. Um, there's normally about five per night, told per night, but like the seventh night has, I don't remember, I wanna say like eight, and the 13th night has 13 tales. Um, there's a total of 75 tales. Originally there were 74 in the first edition, but two of those were swapped out. Sorry, one was swapped out and one was added. So you went from the 73, to uh yeah 74 to 75 and there's yeah you you lose one you gain and you gain another um of those about 20 of those are fairy tales and they show up all the way through i mean they are if you i have a list it's the next slide where we can look at it and go and talk about how many of those make it into into grimm's fairy tales as either as an in no, most cases, an adaptation, but the theme is the same. The plot is the same. Um, they are the same stories that we are hearing. And so of those 75 tales, some of them are, you know, some of them are bodies, some of them are poems, some of them are songs. There's a lot of riddles, um, but a good, a good 20 of them are fairy tales. And they are first published in 1550. 51. So if you as a bard want to tell that tale, you can document it, which is another great reason to, to look at these. Um, Straparola very well may have not been a real person. Um, for instance, his, uh, his last name actually just means babbler or one who talks too much. Now granted, he could have been a real person. Um, there is a, a publisher uh, called Vavasore, who I'm pretty familiar with, with and his name just means to make a little money so you know he may have just gotten this as a as a uh, nickname and taken it as his name but but his name literally means basically someone who talks which i think is incredibly charming personally so but this is this is available you can get a copy of this and like i showed you before there's a there's a recent translation from 2015 or you can just go online and, and read it. Um, again, all of these tales are not fairy tales, um, but, but the first 
examples we have of printed fairy tales come from this book. And this is an example, um, a list of some of those. Um, we have Cassandrino. I, I've just given you a list here, which really is pretty much meaningless, but um, <laughs> if we go through and look at them, I mean, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna tell later on tonight is Constantino Fortunato, um, which is Constantino the Fortunate. And it is, it's a copy, it's a Puss in Boots. Um, Crazy Peter is one that you'll see. Um, it's like one of the like silly hands that you'll see in in Grimm later on. The Pig King is one I'll show you. Um, I think um, Adam and Tina is a really fun one, um, and I might do that one, show you that one as well. But Adam and Tina is kind of a version of the Golden Goose, but in this version. It's a doll that poops gold. So, so there's some there's some interesting things here, uh, but these are all various ones that you will see later on through throughout um, that continue that are probably based on older tales, and continue to find resonance to future generations. Um, another. This gentleman here is John Batista Basile, who was slightly out of period. Um, his, his books were published in 1634. That is posthumous. Um, his sister published them for him when he, after, he, after he died in 1634. So they were written a little bit before and the tales are older. Um, even his version of the tales are older, but they were certainly older tales. Um, it was published as Lo Cunto di Le Cunti. It's in a uh, uh, Napoleon dialect, so it wasn't really super easy for a lot of places to read, but it means tale of tales. It's often referred to as the pentameron because it's 50 tales by 10 tellers over five days, so five each. Um, let's see. SCA period should run to 1650. Um, I, it makes it easier to re research. I don't agree because I think uh, the early modern brain is an interesting thing, but uh, everyone has their opinion. So it, and there's certainly lots of, lots of fun things after 1650. It does certainly make it a lot easier to document recipes and stories and fighting styles, but that's, that's for another day. Um, so some of the ones that you're gonna, that you would recognize oh, okay. from Basile. And trying to um, derail things. I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> Some of the ones you're going to be familiar with in Basile are uh, Petrosinella or Little Parsley, and that's the story of Rapunzel. Legata Centarentola, uh, which is Cinderella. Solo Luna Italia, which is Sleeping Beauty. And Pipo, which is Puss in Boots. Um, and so there's Straparola has his version of Puss in Boots, as does Basile. Um, interestingly enough, I find this absolutely fascinating. The Grimm brothers actually did a translation of Basile. Um, they made it available. Because other than that, the first major, um, comp other than these early literary sources, the first major compilation by Ethnobi uh, um, Ethnobiography, uh, comp 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 compilers in Italy isn't until 1956. So, um, kind of weird, but, but true. But so the, but the Grimm brothers, when they were collecting German tales, also uh, did a translation of, of the seal. Um, most like I said, I'm throwing these in because I needed some extra color so you're not looking at just text. Okay, so why do we care that there are published versions of fairy tales? Fairy tales are cool, but why do we, why do we care? Um, first of all, they're really easy to adapt for Bardic um, because a lot of these are already familiar, but they also give you some examples that are, you know, like I said, there's the golden goose, but in, in the old Italian version, it's a doll that poops gold. Uh, so it gives you a, kind of a, a different way to look at it. Um, it also gives you a place to start. 
Um, and if you want to document it, you absolutely can. Uh, one of the things that my, my daughter went when she was, oh geez, maybe 10 or 12, went won our local Bardic singing Three Blind Mice because she could document it. And uh, so those are those sorts of fun things where it's something you're already familiar with, something you already like, something your audience already likes and knows, but there's a little bit of a twist to it and it makes it super easy to, to, uh, to document. Kids activities are always, it's fun to be able to take something that isn't just, oh, we just found something modern and threw it at the kids, but no, this isn't, this is absolutely, um, just like so what I really have enjoyed reading things like Aesop's fables to kids, just taking the things that they have a familiar, they have a familiarity with, but showing them how it actually is, how it actually is from um, the SCA period is super fun and it feel, makes them feel involved um, and you get to involve them. Adults like them as well, but it's, it's really nice to give everyone a touchstone, something that they're familiar with, but then find them some, something, you know, a little bit of a stretch. I use it as a theme for a feast once. I thought that was a fun thing. Um, the imagery can be inspirational. Um, there's a lot of woodcuts in here that you could pull and use for, for various projects. Um, just use them to feel closer to a mindset. Just, just by reading them, knowing, knowing them, we get to feel a little bit closer to, to people hundreds of years ago because they told the same stories. Um, there are also fun writing prompts to play with to, to expand and to find your own way of like looking at three or four different versions of a tale to write your own version. Um, so that's definitely one. Um, and I'm going to take this opportunity to read you one of the, one of the, one of the stories from Staparola. And this is Constantino and his cat. And it is, it's Puss in Boots. Um, this is directly from the translation. I have in no way changed it. Um, if I were going to tell it for a bardic, I would change it. But as I'm just going to read it so that you can see how a literary version of it feels, we're going to do that. Um, there was once upon a time in Bohemia, a woman, Soriana by name, who lived in great poverty with her three sons, of whom one was called Dusolino, and another Testifone, and the third Costantino Fortunato. Soriana had not of any value in the way of household goods save three things, and these were a kneading trough of the kind women use in the making of bread, a board such as is used in the preparation of pastry, and a cat. Soriana, being now borne down with a very heavy burden of years, saw that death was approaching her, and on this account made her last testament, leaving to do Solino, her oldest son, the kneading trough, to testifone the pasteboard, and to Costantino, the cat. When the mother was dead and duly buried, the neighbors round about would borrow now the kneading trough and now the pasteboard, and as they might happen to want them, and as they knew that the young men were very poor, they gave them by way of repayment a cake, which Dusolino and Tessifone ate by themselves, giving nothing of it to Costantino, the youngest brother. And if Costantino chanced to ask them to give him aught, they would make answer by bidding him to go to his cat, who would without fail let him have what he wanted, and on this account, poor Costantino and his cat underwent much suffering. Now it chanced that this cat of Costantino's was a fairy in disguise. And the cat, feeling much compassion for him and anger at his two brothers on account of their cruel treatment of him, one day said to him, Costantino, do not cast, be cast down, for I will provide you your well-being and sustenance and, be, and for my own as well. Whereupon. The cat sallied forth from the house and went into the fields where it lay down and feigned to be asleep so cleverly that an unsuspecting leveret came close up to where it was lying and was forthwith seized and killed. Then, carrying the leveret, the cat went to the king's palace and having met some of the courtiers who were standing about said that it wanted to speak to the king. When the king heard that a cat had begged an audience with him, he bade them bring it to his presence. And having asked it what his business was, the cat replied, 
that Costantino, its master, had set a leveret as a present to the king and begged his gracious acceptance of the same. And with those words, it presented the leveret Leveret to the king, who was pleased to accept it, asking at the same time who this Costantino might be. The cat replied that he was a young man who, for virtue and good looks, had no superior. And the king, on hearing this report, gave kindly welcome and ordered them to set before it meat and drink of the best. The cat, when it had eaten and drunk enough, dexterously filled the bag in which it had brought the leveret with all sorts of good provender when no one was looking that way, and having taken leave of the king, took the spoil back to Costantino. The two brothers, when they saw Costantino, made good cheer over the victuals, asking him to let them have a share. But he paid them back in their own coin and refused to give them a morsel. Wherefore, on this account, the brothers hereafter were tormented with gnawing envy of Costantino's good fortune. No, Costantino, though he was a good-looking youth, had suffered so much privation and distress that his face was rough and covered with blotches, which caused him much discomfort. So the cat, having taken him one day down to the river, washed him and licked him carefully with its tongue from head to foot and tended him so well that in a few days he was quite freed from his ailment. The cat still went on carrying presents to the royal palace in the fashion already described, and by this means got a living for Costantino. But after a time, the cat began to find these journeyings to and from the palace somewhat irksome. And it feared, moreover, that the king's courtiers might be become impatient thereafter. So it said to Costantino, my master, if you will only do what I shall tell you, in a short time, you will find yourself a rich man. How will you manage this, said Costantino? Then the cat answered, come with me and do not trouble yourself about anything, for I have a plan for making a right rich man of you which cannot fail. Whereupon the cat and Costantino betook themselves to a spot on the bank of the river which was hard by the king's palace, and forthwith the cat bade its master to strip off all his clothes and to throw himself into the river. Then it began to cry and shout in a loud voice, Help! Help! Run, run! For Mr. Costantino is drowning! It happened that the king heard what the cat was crying out, and bearing in mind what great benefits he had received from Costantino, he immediately set some of his household to the rescue. When Costantino had been dragged out of the water and dressed by the attendants in seemly garments, he was led to the presence of the king who gave him a hearty welcome and inquired of him how it was that he found himself in the water. But Costantino, on account of his ag agitation, knew not what reply to make, so the cat, who was always kept at his elbow, answered in his stead, You must know, O king, that some robbers who had learned by the agency of a spy that my master was taking a great store of jewels to offer them to you as a present, laid wait for him and robbed him of his treasure, and then wishing to murder him, they threw him into the river. But by the aid of these gentlemen, he has escaped death. The king, when he heard this, gave orders that Costantino should have the best of treatment. And seeing that he was well made and handsome and believed him to be very rich, he made up his mind to give his daughter Elizetta to wife and to endow her with a rich dowry of gold and jewels and sumptuous raiment. When the nuptial ceremonies were completed and the festivities at an end, the king bade them load ten mules with gold and five with the richest garments and sent the bride, accompanied by a great concourse of people, to her husband's house. Costantino, when he saw himself so highly honored and loaded with riches, was in sore perplexity as to where he should carry his bride and took counsel with the cat thereat. Said the cat, be not troubled about this business, my master. We will provide for everything. So, as they were riding all merrily together, the cat left the others and rode on rapidly in advance. And after it had left the company a long way behind, it came upon certain cavaliers whom it thus addressed. Alas, you poor fellows, what are you doing here? Get hence as quickly as you can, for a great body of armed men is coming along this road and will surely attack and despoil you. See, they're now quite near. Listen to the noise of those neighing horses. Whereupon the horseman, overcome with fear, said to the cat, What then shall we do? And the cat made answer, It will be best for you to act in this wise. If they should question you as to whose men you are, you must answer boldly that you serve Messer Constantino, and then no one will molest you. 
and the cat left them, and having ridden on still further, came upon great flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, and it told the same story and gave the same counsel to the shepherds and drovers who had charge of them. When going on still further, it spake to the same terms on whoever it chanced, whomsoever it chanced to meet. And the cavalcade of the princess passed on, and the gentlemen who were accompanying her asked of the horsemen whom they had met the name of their lord, and the herdsmen who, who might be the owner, owner of these sheep and oxen. And the answer given by all was that they served Messer Costantino. Then the gentlemen of the escort said to the bridegroom, so, Mr. Costantino, it appears we are now entering your dominions. And Costantino nodded his head in token of assent, and in like manner he made answer to all their interrogations, so that all the company of this account judged him to be enormously rich. In the meantime, the cat had ridden on and had come to a fair and stately castle, which was guarded by a very weak garrison. And these defenders the cat addressed in the following words. My good men, what is it you do? Surely you must be aware of the ruin which is about to overwhelm you. What's the ruin you speak of, demanded the guards. Why, before another hour shall be gone by, replied the cat, your pl place will be beleaguered by a great company of soldiers who will cut you in pieces. Do you not already hear the neighing of the horses and see the dust in the air? Wherefore, unless you are minded to perish, take heed of my advice which will bring you safely out of all danger. For if anyone shall demand of you whose this castle is, say that it belongs to Master Costantino Fortunato. And when the time came, the guards gave answer as the cat had directed. For when the noble escort of the bride had arrived at the stately castle, the certain gentleman had inquired of the guards the name of the lord of the castle. They were answered that it was Master Costantino Fortunato. And when the whole company had entered the castle, they were honorably lodged therein. Now the lord of this manor was a certain Signor Valentino, a very brave soldier, who only a few days ago had left his castle to bring back there to the wife he had recently espoused. But as ill fortune would have it, there happened on him a road, him on the road, some while before he came to the palace where his beloved wife was abiding, an unhappy and unforeseen accident by which he straightway met his death. So Constantino Fortunato retained the lordship of Valentino's castle. Not long after this, Morando, king of Bohemia, died, and the people by acclamation chose Costantino Fortunato for their king, seeing that he had espoused Elisetta, the late king's daughter, to whom by right the succession of the kingdom belonged. And by these means, Costantino rose from an estate of poverty, or even beggary, to be a powerful king, and lived long with Elisetta, his wife, leaving children by her to the heirs of his kingdom. And that is the end. So that's one. There are lots and lots more. Um, I put in here, we have the Pig King as well as um, Magic Doll and a few others, but uh, we're kind of running low on time. So, and I already made you listen to one. So, but there are, I guess there are at least 20, 20 in there in um, Strap, Straparola, as well as several more and Basile. Um, and super interesting stuff. Um, I'm fascinated by them and getting to play with with uh, fairy tales and having easy documentation to get to use them for however I want to. All right, any other questions? Anything I can answer? Anybody have fa have favorite fairy tales they want to talk about? <laughs> 